a little bit of slides, but this is kind of when you're with that person and whatever symptoms they're having, um, when uh, they go to the provider, they're kind of ruling out, or I should say, honing down all of these different diagnoses to try and get the most accurate um, for that person, because then they can formulate their treatment plan that's going to be the best for them and give them, hopefully, the expect or meet the expectations that that person has for themselves to feel better and function better. So um, I threw in a couple slides, kindly refrain from Googling the doctor's diagnosis until she's finished giving it to you. Google is yin and yang. It's good, it's bad. Um, be careful. Um, I like when people come into me and they, you know, they're like, I Googled this and I have questions about this. And then that opens the door for conversation. So it's not wrong, but sometimes it can be a little bit of a rabbit hole and it will kind of take you into more scarier things or um, really random things that probably are not even uh, on our di or on the provider's mind as far as being a possibility of the diagnosis. So, um, you know, you can do that, but be careful and just asking the provider um, will be best when, if you're with the peer or if the peer is looking things up, um, just kind of say, you know, uh, write down your questions and let the provider know that you looked it up and see what they say about it. Because sometimes it is valid. And I appreciate when the patient reminds me that. Okay, so first and foremost, treat medical conditions first. Um, what we want to make sure is that um, the peer is stable, meaning that um, they're breathing okay and their heart rate's okay and their blood pressure nothing is really, really seriously wrong um, where we have to first, you know, make sure that we address that um, or um, before the mental health diagnosis, like I said, um, because if they're unstable, then the mental health treatment is kind of pushed aside because the person is um, not gonna make it if we don't treat that. So making sure their oxygen's okay, um, sometimes uh, patients uh, that have COPD, so smokers, right, long-term smokers, if their oxygen's really low, they might be acting confused or kind of funny. Um, things to think about, too, are if they've been taking opiates and they're kind of really sedated, that can actually lower the respiratory rate, too, and potentially they could be um, confused um, and not acting kind of, or just uh, acting irrationally because they're not having enough oxygen. And then uh, things that the provider also would look at is, you know, blood work sometimes, like I was saying, is it something to do with hormones or um, if somebody comes to you and they're diabetic and their sugars are really, really low or too high, that can cause some symptoms that might mimic a mental health diagnosis. Uh, infection is a big one um, in our um, uh, older generation in that um, they don't usually have symptoms as when you're younger, like with uh, urinary tract infections. They don't feel different. They don't have any pain, but they're acting really unusual. And um, so you want to make sure that it's not an infection that's causing their symptoms. Um, and then you get into things that are a little bit less likely. So um, seizure disorders, strokes, um, if they have some sort of lesion on their um, brain, a mass, um, then you're looking at autoimmune disorders, uh, metabolic diseases. And so I just listed them all here. Um, so that if you see one, you kind of know. And then the list goes down, you know, did they have an injury um, prior to this? And so that's why they're kind of uptended or confused, um, blurring their words, something else. It might be they fell and hit their head. And um, so that's important to make sure that you, you don't do that, but things to kind of think about or ask them, I guess, maybe um, if they're unable to um, give all the information to the provider. 
um, a urine drug screen, and then you go down if they're pregnant, and then making sure their heart's okay, um, imaging the brain, that's neuroimaging with MRI or CAT scan, and then lumbar puncture, which is really pretty rare. So once we get kind of all this information and we um, hone it all down into a diagnosis, now the next step after that um, is kind of what's listed here. So the assessment is all of that information that the provider will do for your peer. And then they kind of say, okay, this is our treatment plan. And so we'll go over the different treatment plans, like I had said, for medical substance and, or mental health and then substance. So, you know, I actually took this from the psychiatrist I work with, and this is kind of in our treatment plan. I really like it though, because, you know, it kind of gives me some short-term and long-term goals. What are we going to reduce, improve, resolve? Biological therapy is um, things that they're going to take. Um, usually orally, so medications, um, supplements, <clears throat> vitamins, and then we go over what are potential side effects of these and any follow-up labs, and then if they need to be referred somewhere else to a neurologist or um, a sleep specialist if they um, are, have sleep apnea, and then um, psychosocial is kind of, that's where, you know, we get into do we need to help with um, living situation, jobs, relationships, or where do we send them for that? And then a risk assessment. Are they safe? You know, can they be by themselves? Or do we need to, you know, we'll go through the plan. Um, who can you contact? What are your protective factors? Um, meaning things that they have reasons to live for. Um, what are some of the precipitating factors? So things that kind of led to this change in how they're feeling about their life and then really lining out with um, the provider will line out with the peer. You know, these are who you call if you're feeling unsafe. This is where you go if you're feeling unsafe and they might be calling you. And then, you know, um, if they're really unsafe, it's 911 or you take them to the hospital and make sure that they stay in a safe place until they're evaluated and treated and then other follow up so as I was saying, goals of the treatment. So what are we trying to reduce? And so sometimes, you know, this could be um, they're not taking their medicine like they should be. And so if they're not doing that, then they're not going to see the full benefit of the medicine and they're not going to feel as stable, um, maybe reduce cravings if they're having some for substances. And how do we do that? Um, then these other symptoms that uh, they may not want or it's, um, yeah, unwanted symptoms, improve. What do we want to improve for them? You know, getting nice restorative sleep, at least seven to nine hours so that they have good energy and concentration and motivation. Um, hedonistic drive means that they want to do, when, when they do things, they get um, pleasure out of it or that they want to do them. And so that could be meeting with friends and, you know, kind of these good positive things that we look forward to, going out to dinner, enjoying food, or um, maybe having, you know, a goal of making something. And so that, that's kind of that hedonistic drive. And then socialization, support, relationships, making sure their diet's good, they're getting some physical activity. So things that we want to improve there. And then what do we want to resolve? And this is kind of the diagnosis itself, which is, not that's our goal right but maybe the goal is to resolve most of it not all of it and so that's a work in progress with that with the peer patient and peer and you get to help them and so i thought this was um kind of funny too i do not cost 150 dollars an hour but i kind of want to do that and if a telemarketer calls and says that Biological treatment. So what can they take um, for their certain um, disorders? And so the, I kind of listed out, you know, um, if it's medical, then you would treat the underlying medical condition. So if they have a low thyroid, um, which means that the peer would feel really tired and um, unmotivated, 
probably sleeping a lot, um, gaining weight um, easily, um, kind of some symptoms that sometimes mimic depression. And even if you give them an antidepressant, it's not going to get them that much better because they need thyroid medicine. And then substance use disorder. So that's a multimodal kind of treatment there that we'll go over. Um, the medication-induced disorder, we would stop that medicine that's causing it um, and try something different. And so making sure it's a medicine not causing some of these symptoms in a peer. And that's why um, making sure you, you know, if you're going to help them um, and advocate for them um, with in a provider situation, making sure you know everything that they are taking and supplements and other things like that. And then um, psychotic disorders, um, the pr provider will treat them with, <clears throat> excuse me, antipsychotics, and then bipolar disorders, mood stabilizers. And then going down the list, and you guys can read this, but so basically, um, when we know what the diagnosis is, then we can really start to, uh, and depending on the person, right, and their personality and their history, and there's so much information that we'll gather, <laughs> excuse me, and their cultural background. And so really the provider's goal is to meet the patient where they're at and um, to work within their values and try to get some feedback um, of what their expectations or hopes are and then how we can get them there. And so sometimes it's medicine, sometimes it's counseling, therapy, and there's different types of therapy, um, which I have listed there if, um, if you ever hear them. DBT is dialectical behavior therapy, behavioral activation, acceptance and commitment therapy is ACT. Um, there's also family therapy, <clears throat> which we talk later in the substance disorders. Um, and then some things for trauma, uh, a lot of new information coming out there of treatment for um, your peers, if they're exhibiting a lot of emotional and um, physical symptoms from the trauma. And so um, eye movement desensitization, that's EMDR, uh, that's been found to be very helpful. And how that works is, um, I'm not trained in it, but uh, the counselor, or if you help them, you know, get to, or find a counselor that does EMDR, um, they will remember a painful memory and the counselor will have them move their eyes a certain way. And as they're doing that, it's, it's actually taking that painful memory from one part of the brain and kind of refiling it into another part of the brain. So from the amygdala to the hippocampus. Um, and, and when we do that, it decreases the emotional and physical reaction when they remember the memory because it's making it kind of more of a benign memory, kind of like what I had for breakfast this morning or when I took my dog for a walk. And so that's a really good one. Um, biofeedback, and that's uh, a way for, just so you guys kind of know what these treatments are, just uh, like, oh, I heard that before. And um, so that would be, you would be uh, on a, a computer screen and they would say, okay, try to move. It's like playing a video game with your mind. A little bit move this little you know um, spaceship to the top of the screen and the patient if they try really really hard usually it won't move it and when they relax and they kind of relax their body and relax their thinking then they'll see it start to move and so it's a way for them to kind of get some positive feedback um, with relaxation which helps with trauma and then those other play and drama rehearsal Personality disorders, there'll be a lot of different, a lot of different providers have different um, takes on treatment for these. Um, some options are cognitive behavioral therapy, so uh, dialectical behavioral therapy, kind of helping them understand 
the things that they do. And so if the behavior is causing a, a, some sort of reaction or consequence that they don't like, then it's having them refocus on um, how can I change my behavior so that I get the reaction that I do want or the consequence that I would like. And sometimes medication can help with that. Um, sometimes we're looking at you know, occupational therapy, that's OT, physical therapy and speech therapy, um, eating disorders, um, a lot of different modalities there, support groups, medication, nutritionists, um, hospitalization sometimes. Um, sometimes when peers come to you, they might be really um, malnourished. And so um, it's important that you help them and get your, you know, maybe, well, helping them, you know, getting some food and water if they need in a social situation or how to find that, but also, you know, going to the provider and letting them know oh, they've lost a lot of weight and, you know, how making sure that they kind of know that so that they can um, check and make sure that um, their electrolytes are okay and their sugars and their protein and things like that so that they get stronger and healthier and then they can start working on the behaviors um, or, and or the substance use. Uh, bereavement disorders, gender dysphoria, that's therapy, medication sometimes, same with ADHD, traumatic brain injuries, um, as well as the, the last one. Okay, going on to modalities for substance use disorders. So, um, here, I just listed off, you know, some of the most common substances. I didn't list Kratom. Uh, that's a tricky one. Um, there are some treatments for that as well. Alcohol and benzodiazepines, they work on GABA receptors in the brain. And so first and foremost, um, if you have a peer that is coming for help that um, has been um, using alcohol or benzodiazepines excessively, um, try to help them get to a medical provider very soon or the hospital, because if they withdraw, that can be um, life-threatening. You can die from alcohol or benzodiazepine withdrawals. And so you must taper them off, meaning um, you know, slowly going down on the dose of the medicine until they're completely off of it and kind of allowing their brain and their body to readjust with all of the uh, proteins and receptors that um, bind the alcohol or benzodiazepines. And then there's some examples of medicines that we can use. Um, opioids, which you feel like you're gonna die, but you typically don't um, when you're withdrawing, I should say. Um, and so, it's very uncomfortable though, and it's very difficult. And um, so here's some medicines that they can use for that as well. The, um, just so you, if you just, you know, recognize names, I guess, but the provider will decide what's best for them. Um, and then the CAL score, um, I did put that on here. So you can kind of see what we're looking at, providers are with the peer when we're assessing how severe their withdrawal is. And when we would start a medicine like Suboxone, which Monica talked to you about, um, well, medication-assisted treatment um, or uh, buprenorphine, Subutex, or some other ones, um, the alcohol and benzodiazepine tapering scale, scale is the CWA. And so I have an example of that too, that they would use um, to basically know, okay, it's time to step down or nope, they're still too, um, they're withdrawing too much and it's too early to step down safely. Stimulants, uh, so these are, you know, um, ADD medications, so Adderall or Ritalin and as well as methamphetamine. Um, what we're watching for is high blood pressure, um, hyperthermia, it can raise their temperature and then they haven't been sleeping and they can be psychotic. And so really just giving them rest and nutrition and making sure that their vital signs are safe. Marijuana can also cause high blood pressure, anxiety, depression. Um, it can also 
induced psychosis and hyperemesis, which means a lot of vomiting, excessive, excessive vomiting. Um, so that it can be a side effect of that one. And then hallucinogens. And so that is just kind of giving it time to wear off. And so here is that um, kind of blurry. Sorry about that. The CWA for the alcohol and benzodiazepine withdrawal. And so basically, um, what the provider will ask, you know, are these um, questions on you know, are they sweating? How about are there tremors? Are they anxious? Are they agitated? Um, are they visually hallucinating? Do they have headaches? Um, are they feeling creepy crawly things all over their body? A lot of information. Hopefully it's not too much. And then the Clinical opiate withdrawal scale, the cow score. So this is for opiates. And so you're gonna rate, and maybe Monica already went over this with you, but the provider will rate, excuse me. Um, basically their pulse, um, pupils, if they're dilated, if they're um, moving with light, sweat, sweating, if they have goosebumps, um, runny nose, um, gastrointestinal anxiety. So they'll rate all of this, and then usually if the score is 10 or greater, the provider can then initiate um, medication-assisted treatment. Uh, it depends on the provider. Sometimes they'll wait till 12, but you really wanna make sure that the peer, well, the provider needs to make sure that the peer is in bad enough withdrawals when they give that medicine so that they don't make the withdrawals even worse. All right, Courtney, we've had a couple yeah. questions come through. If this is a good time to share those oh, yeah. with you. Uh -huh. All right, so the first one is, why do people get diagnosed as a child and then don't show intense symptoms until they're 30 sometimes? For example, my experience with schizoaffective disorder. So I would need probably more information uh, for instance, if you had some trauma as a child, you can uh, cope with that in different ways, and that may have presented like a schizoaffective disorder. Um, not sure. You're, what I'm understanding from the question is that um, you were diagnosed as a child, but you didn't have symptoms, which doesn't make sense to me, unless maybe your parents were exaggerating. I don't know. On the symptoms and then you start having them as an adult so all right and then the next question is i've not yet heard of any professionals that address the problem of kratom is there a credible resource that you can mention um you know you can go to echo idaho so um extend, extended extensive community health outreach which is through university of idaho and it's on YouTube. And so if you Google um, Echo Idaho Kratom, it will bring up their lecture and all their slides and information on it. It's very, very um, good. And it talks about uh, treatment and Kratom itself, kind of what it does in your body, where it comes from, you know, the plant, the tea. Um, it is, it's tricky because it works on lots of different receptors in different amounts so it depends on how much you take and so you get different symptoms and the um, recovery from that's pretty challenging from what i've seen in the addiction center and in my outpatient practice thanks courtney and then yeah. the last question that we have um, for now is is stimulant withdrawal potentially deadly no unless your vital signs you know so if your blood pressure was um, really, really high or really, really low, uh, where your heart's not getting oxygen or so high that it could, it's um, called hypertension urgency or emergency, and it can actually cause a stroke or a heart attack because there's too much pressure. Um, it's not technically from the stimulant, it's a, um, the stimulant 
will cause changes in your blood vessels and your heart and some other things that then may make it a little bit more dangerous, but not like alcohol or benzodiazepines. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So treatment options we have um, inpatient versus outpatient, you know, where is the patient at? What's their life like? Um, how bad is the substance abuse? And so sometimes you'll have acute hospitalizations um, or it could be to you know taper them off the alcohol or benzos. So maybe it's like a week or less uh, up to 30 day inpatient treatment programs. And the sky's the limit, I think with inpatient treatments, I've heard some as long as six months um, and there might be even more. Um, and then you're looking at kind of these intensive outpatient treatments. And so you can look, the peer, you know, can, um, these are options for them, partial hospitalization. So it's like a day program and similar probably to IOP. Um, are they in drug court or wood court? Are there legal, you know, implications or um, things that they have to do for their substance abuse, um, urine tox screens, urine drug screens? And then um, mutual help groups. So smart recovery, support groups, you guys, AA, NA, and then counseling. Usually a lot of, a combination of a lot of these. And then here are the medications we can use. So um, for opiates, we have naltrexone, buprenorphine, or methadone, uh, depending on uh, where the peer goes and what the provider can do. I can't prescribe methadone for um, opiate dependence um, in remission, but I can for acute pain or chronic pain. So there's um, different things there. Um, for alcohol and sedatives, you would use a benzodiazepine, like I was saying, so Ativan, clonazepam, uh, typically not Xanax, Librium. It's usually Ativan or Librium or Clonopin and kind of slowly taper them off. And then ideally you don't want them on it though, because it lowers their impulse control and it's actually a trigger for them to relapse. Uh, then you have, once they're off of that, to keep them off, Vivitrol, so the injection of naltrexone, acamprosate is an option. And then I list a bunch of others that uh, is on a medical resource that I use up to date. Uh, stimulant, so dopamine agonists, long acting, um, to get them off the stimulant. Sometimes modafinil, which is provigil, it's a medicine used for like narcolepsy um, and sleep shift work disorders. But sometimes patients that have really bad stimulant use disorders, if they take provigil, which is not a stimulant, but it actually kind of helps that craving and kind of gives them back a little bit of normalcy, if you will. It's not indicated for it, so sometimes insurance won't pay for it, but, and then there's um, other ones listed there, Anabuse, Topamax, Wellbutrin, Celexa, Chantix. Um, for methamphetamine, they're saying treatments could be Suboxone or buprenorphine, mirtazapine, which is Remeron. That's one that they use for sleep sometimes. It works on your melatonin receptors. Uh, hallucinogens, there wasn't really a medication that I could see that helped with hallucinogen withdrawal or maintenance off of it. And then uh, marijuana was N acetylcysteine or Topamax. So providers might be thinking of this for your peer. In addition to you know, motivational interviewing, um, skills training. So do they need help with, you know, voc rehab or some other things, contingency management, um, rewarding them when they um, stay sober uh, with monetary. So either some money or maybe it's gift cards uh, for coffee shops or I don't know, McDonald's, whatever. And then, um, technology assisted management. So now we have smartphone apps that can help with recovery and kind of, you know, making sure, hey, you know, how, maybe rating, you know, how my mood is or this happened or triggers or so things like that they can do on their own. These are all treatment options for substance use. And that brought me a little bit short. But I'm wondering if you guys have any more questions for me. 
yes, you actually, we do have questions. So yeah. um, in your one of your previous slides, you mentioned wood court. Can you clarify what that is for folks? Yes. So um, I am not going to be the best, honestly, to tell you what that is. If you, I have a friend that actually works for drug court and wood court. They're a little bit different. I think basically um, the um, parameters for um, how often they have to be urine drug screened and um, how much treatment they have to be in are different a little bit. So most of them, these are court ordered kind of, you know, you have to go to counseling, you have to go to so many AA, NAs, you have to have so many urine drug screens, you have to pay fines, you have to um, go see a provider. And so it's similar to drug court, but different. And I apologize, I don't know that. We could ask someone that's worked in that system. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, so let me read through this one's a little bit longer. Okay. So I'm part of the Overeaters Anonymous Recovery Dharma, a group, a Buddhist group, a Buddhist based recovery group, and a sober activity based activity group, which is sometimes plugged at the Dharma meetings. I have found these to be imperative in my addiction recovery, as well as my maintaining solid friendships instead of toxic people in my life since I got rid of toxicity. I have been able to get, I have been able to reach so many more goals than in the past, and I am taking serious steps towards becoming a peer support specialist in the near future. I'm a college graduate with near honors in my major and one of my many certificates, despite being brain injured on the spectrum with schizoaffective mm -hmm. disorder, depression and anxiety type, as well as HLA, gene chronic pain and possible marathon syndrome. I'm so sorry. I thought I saw spondylitis. Mm -hmm. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, HLA. Yeah, is uh, maybe ankylosing spondylitis. So it causes problems in the back and other. Oh, gotcha. But Thank what were you, you saying? Mm -hmm. I'm realizing that that was um, an excerpt that somebody was just sharing about themselves. Um, oh. There wasn't a question in there, but I do appreciate uh, that that information uh, that you shared with us to the participant. Yeah, there's so many. I mean, it, that's the beauty of treatment for mental health and substance. And um, there's so many different options, you know, like it could be music therapy, it could be playing an instrument, it could be yoga or mindfulness. And so it's just kind of what works for you and that really helps you. And you, you get to keep going with that and you're doing great. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Okay, so question, how do we help create parity in the cost of treatment between medical and mental health costs? Um, that's a good question. So depending on if the patient has insurance, um, that will kind of drive where you want to go. Uh, no matter what, they can be seen at an emergency department. There are laws where um, regardless of their ability to pay, they'll be seen and treated and taken care of and made sure that they're on the road, the correct road. Um, they rule out emergencies, but if they need to be hospitalized or other things, and that's kind of their doorway in a lot of times. You can look at... Um, federally qualified health centers. I used to work at one where they do sliding scale. And so they usually have mental health as well as the medical in one building, which is really nice. So providers can kind of work together as a team. Harry um, Riley down there in Boise. Thanks, Courtney. I also want to quickly say that Empower Idaho, we are going to be organizing a presentation on parity um, in November. So keep an eye out for that information. All right. And then other question that we had, where did, where did you say to go for more information on Kratom? Yeah. 
echo e c h o idaho youtube and put in kratom <clears throat> so echo idaho kratom on youtube Thank you. Mm -hmm. I don't have any other questions coming in from folks, but I'm curious if you can um, just follow up or explain a little bit more about the CIWA rating. The CIWA. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So blood pressure and pulse are the main vital signs that you take with someone that is detoxing from alcohol. When you're detoxing or withdrawing and it's going to be severe enough that you need treatment, your blood pressure will be very, very high. So greater than usually 140s over 90s and your pulse will be very high. So your body's going into some distress um, that can cause then a seizure. And if you're in status, epilep status epilepticus for very long, and you can die from that. So those two are very important. You must have those. And then the rest are kind of subjective. And so the patient's gonna tell you, I mean, not always, tremor is more objective. You can kind of see what the tremor looks like. If they're sweating profusely, if they're actively throwing up, you know, then that's um, gonna be a seven. Um, if they're feeling creepy crawly on their skin, you can't tell that. Or if they're hearing things, seeing things, hallucinating, they'll tell you about that. Headache, how bad that is. Um, and then are they aware where they are? Are they confused? Um, sometimes you can get, um, it's like Wernicke's encephalopathy. So it's where the brain um, gets inflamed from alcohol. Um, and then you kind of have a lot of confusion and it's almost like a dementia, if you will, from alcohol. And so in order to get the correct score, you have to go through every single one of those items listed with the number and then you'll get, and then you'll tally them up and you'll get the total number. And then Thank depending, you. yeah. I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> oh, I was just gonna say, Depending on the total score, um, the provider will give you um, basically parameters on, okay, if they score um, 15 or greater, then give them, you know, this much Librium or Ativan every four hours, or, you know, they'll tell you. So they typically will do this entire thing about every two to four hours when someone's withdrawing from alcohol pretty heavily. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So the question, what kind of complications arise when we see multi-substance use, for example, alcohol, methamphetamine, or op opioids, and what, if anything, changes in the, with the recovery treatment plan? Well, um, medically speaking, if you were on all of those, you'd still be looking at, you know, first things first, vital signs. Um, are they safe with the alcohol? You're going to be doing CWAS. You can do cows with the opiates. There's not a, that I'm aware of, a rating scale for methamphetamine withdrawal. Um, and so making sure that they're medically stable first. And once they've detoxed and they're stable, then we start, you know, okay, what are we, where are they at with their treatment? And that's um, when you have polysubstance abuse, you know, so lots of different. Um, the follow-up treatment can be the same with all of them, but it would be individually too. So it's, you know, support. It's um, what is their social situation? Uh, medications will be different for treating them. Um, are they getting enough sleep? Is there an underlying, you know, mental health disorder that's kind of triggering them? Um, sometimes people with bipolar disorder, when they're manic, will just kind of go out and do impulsive things and use a bunch of drugs and um, which then makes the mania worse. And so I don't know if that answered that all the way, but. Thanks. Mm -hmm. 
inpatient rehabilitation is so nice because the person's in a controlled environment and they're getting, you know, they're, they have a routine. They're waking up the same time. They're getting fed the same time. They're being immersed in individual and group therapy. Um, they also have, a, you know, usually different um, hobbies or I was going to say play therapy, you know, that that the person just kind of gets back that sense of, oh, this is fun. I enjoy doing this sober and, and kind of that positive feedback. And so, and they're getting their medications on time. So that's nice sometimes if you have a, a significant polysubstance um, abuse disorder. Thanks. And then we have the question, how long is an opioid withdrawal? Well, it depends on the opioid. Um, and how long the person was taking it, and everyone's different. Um, it could be a few hours to days because your metabolism, everybody has different metabolism, metab everyone has different <laughs> rates of metabolism, and so it, it varies. And methadone is a very long opioid. It lasts 72 hours. Um, in your body. So that one can extend out quite a ways as well as Kratom. Thank you. Okay, so I'm not seeing any other questions come through. Feel free to type one out um, right now if you have one, but in the meantime, final, final thoughts, final words, CEU eligibility again, please check your confirmation and reminder emails for all of the requirements that you need to complete in order for you to receive that certificate. And that includes completing the evaluation, getting two out of the three content specific questions correctly, attending the session the whole time, and also um, being sure that you're not calling in and you are here able to see the slides and fully present um, for the training. Again, feel free to reference that email uh, because it does have a lot more information on that. Okay, and so I had a question come in within that. What is your feelings on Kratom? I know a lot of people use it use because it's plant, it's a plant for pain meds. What withdrawals like on that and treatment? Um, Kratom scares me, to be honest. Uh, especially after watching what I've seen in patients and um, reading about it in literature. And it's, um, it's over the counter. I mean, it's not regulated right now by the FDA. There was, a, and on the Echo Idaho presentation, it talks about this. There was a big group that lobbied because they were actually going to take it, um, they were gonna make it a controlled substance uh, one, which means there's no purpose for it. It's like cocaine, uh, um, methamphetamine, so all the other controlled substances that we don't prescribe typically. And um, there was a big lobby group that bought it, and so it's still available. You don't know how much you're getting. It's not regulated that way. Um, I know, you know, it does come from a plant. Um, there might be a purpose for it. There just hasn't been enough studies to really know what that purpose is or in how, what dose for what diagnoses. Um, and then because it has opioid-like properties uh, as well as stimulant-like properties, if you take it on a regular basis, you will potentially become dependent on it, which means you'll withdraw if you stop as well as um, tolerant, meaning you need more and more and more. And the more and more and more you take, then that's where you get, it's harder and harder to um, detox off. Uh, and it also starts affecting um, your whole body differently with higher blood pressure and heart rate and um, it's sympathetic, parasympathetic dysregulation, um, sweating and nausea and all kinds of other side effects. That um, presentation on Echo Idaho is really good on YouTube. It answered, it, um, it is evidence-based and um, 
she does a really good job presenting it with slides and pictures and everything. Thanks, Courtney. Mm -hmm. Looks like those are all the questions that we received. So unless you have any other last minute commentary, I'm good to call it a couple minutes early. Um, I just wanna say thank you guys so, so much um, for helping um, others. And it's so nice when um, you kind of have gone through that, you know, because then the compassion is there and the motivation and, and, and just really being in tune with the, this person when they're hurting. And so, so nice. And I love um, referring most of my patients to uh, the peer recovery services throughout Idaho. Thank you. Thanks, Courtney. Mm -hmm. Bye.